Wonder surrounds us. Asking what we never thought to question. Now you can experience it all. The new National Geographic Channel. Always wonder. Call your cable or satellite provider to experience the new National Geographic Channel. Now available from National Geographic Home Video. June 1942, the Japanese and Americans face off at Midway in what has been called one of the greatest naval battles of all time. Today, National Geographic and Dr. Robert Ballard take you three miles and a half century below the surface. But what they find is more than just an aircraft carrier lost at sea. They find a story of heroes and martyrs, of triumph and tragedy. They find the story of the battle for Midway. World War II, where no challenge was too great if it meant stopping the enemy. It was this spirit that allowed ordinary men to perform unthinkable acts of courage and sacrifice. From Norway, where resistance fighters crippled Hitler's atomic bomb project, to kamikaze pilots on suicide missions in the Pacific, National Geographic Television presents the untold stories of World War II. Call 800-627-5162 to order these and many other National Geographic home videos. Stay tuned after Pearl Harbor, a legacy of attack for National Geographic's U-Boats, Terror on Our Shore. And now, our feature presentation. This is a National Geographic Channel special presentation. December 6, 1941. Darkness has settled over the U.S. Navy base at Pearl Harbor. Thousands of sailors and soldiers are returning from shore leave, unaware of the attack that is about to be launched against them. Welcome to a special edition of National Geographic Channel Presents. I'm Tom Brokaw. That terrible day that we call Pearl Harbor happened 60 years ago. You might think that time has healed all the wounds, that the shock has worn off, that historians have told us all the stories there are to tell. That's not true. Pearl Harbor was so unexpected, so brutal, so chaotic, that we're still struggling to understand all that happened that day. Undersea explorer Robert Ballard wants to fill in some of the gaps. He's on the trail of a secret Japanese weapon, a flotilla of midget submarines that were trying to penetrate Pearl Harbor before the attack. This then is a story of secrecy and treachery, of Japanese warriors preparing to die for their country, of Americans completely unprepared for a day that would change their lives forever. They were 18, or 19, or 20 years old, sailors in a tropical paradise. They didn't know that on the other side of the ocean, another group of young men was preparing to strike them while they slept. Their paths would cross for a few short hours on a Sunday morning in December. And in one terrifying instant, more than 1,000 of them would die. 
the legacy of what happened on December 7th still haunts us today. In the first images from inside the USS Arizona, an underwater cemetery that's also an ecological time bomb. In the search for a top secret Japanese submarine that was sunk about an hour before the attack began. The submarine's heading north starting to die and in the quest to learn what really happened that day and most of all it still lives on in the memories of the men who were there when everything changed just a young kid when this happened and i've lived through it i lost a lot of my friends I reached down to try to help him. I scared him. <laughs> oh, came off. But I hope it never happens again. Nobody will ever know what it was like, except somebody that was actually there. They never had a chance. They didn't know what was coming. Nobody knew about it. They never woke up. This is the story of a day when the history of the world took an unexpected turn at a sleepy little port in Hawaii called Pearl Harbor. first summer of the new millennium. 60 years ago on this island, a battle was fought, perhaps the most one-sided battle in American history. It plunged the United States into war and in the space of a little more than two hours, took the lives of 2,400 Americans. Ever since that day, Pearl Harbor has been a place of pilgrimage. Many of the men who lived through the attack have returned at least once to remember what happened and to pay their respects to friends who didn't make it. We remember December 7, 1941, when so many gave the last devotion of their Well, it was kind of hard, yes, I'll admit it, because I couldn't do anything that the other guys could. I was only five foot three and weighed 125 pounds. My battle station was a number two loader on a five inch gun, and I couldn't even pick up the shells that had to be put in the gun. How can this ever happen? One of the strongest navies in the world, and we're sitting here with our pants down. We got caught, period. was one of the best assignments in the Navy. A sailor joining the Pacific Fleet in Hawaii could expect warm air, lots of sunshine, and plenty of things to do on shore leave. In the Atlantic Theater, things were different. Europe had been at war for more than two years. Hitler's soldiers occupied Paris. London was being blitzed by Nazi bombs. Hello! 
For sailors stationed in the Pacific, there was only one threat on the horizon. Yet most Americans knew next to nothing about the country or its people, who were thought to be short and nearsighted. Quaint little people ruled by an old-fashioned emperor. In reality, Japan was a modern military power that had signed a pact with Nazi Germany. Japanese troops brutally occupied parts of China and were poised to move against other neighbors. But the United States Pacific Fleet stood in the way, and early in 1941, the Japanese military decided to do something about that. Why would Japan want to go to war with the United States? What Japan wanted was the oil fields in the Dutch East Indies. What they wanted was the tin and the rubber out of Malaya. They wanted the Philippines because of its strategic location. Nobody thought that they would ever come out to Pearl Harbor. That's how you achieve surprise in war. You attack where nobody expects it. It was the brainchild of a 57-year-old Japanese admiral named Isoroku Yamamoto. Yamamoto decided to strike the U.S. fleet at its home base, at anchor in the cramped, shallow harbor near Honolulu. For Yamamoto, he had studied in the United States. He had gone to Harvard. He knew what the Americans were like. And he said at one point, I don't care if we march troops down Pennsylvania Avenue, we're not going to conquer the United States. He planned the attack with the idea that if we're going to have any chance of winning this war, we've got to destroy the American fleet. And that'll give us six months to run wild in the Southwest Pacific. And we can build up a defensive barrier that will be very difficult for the Americans to crack. And at some point, they're going to say, we quit. We're, you keep your gains. In the spring of 1941, planning for the attack began in earnest, although only a handful of Japanese officers knew about it. A talented pilot named Minoru Genda was given the task of figuring out how to inflict maximum damage on the American fleet, especially its battleships and carriers, in a surprise attack from the air. Genda decided that a combination of bombs and torpedoes modified to operate in shallow waters would have the best chance of success. Late that summer and into the fall, Japanese pilots trained for their top secret mission. They rehearsed the low altitude attack angles they would need over the harbor. They practiced strafing runs over and over. By fall, Yamamoto's plan had evolved into a mammoth undertaking that would require six carriers, more than 350 airplanes, and almost as an afterthought, five midget submarines. Those five midget submarines played a curious and little known part in the attack and an expedition is getting underway in Honolulu to learn more. One of the tiny subs almost cost Japan the critical element of surprise. And there's only two outliers. And that's Target the one 32. undersea explorer Target Robert 16. Ballard is hoping to find. To the east. For the man who found the Titanic and the, and the Bismarck, attacked. This search represents a unique right challenge. It's one of the smallest the ships Ballard's ever looked for, and no one really knows where it sank. How are you? Nice, 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 nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Joining him will be a man who was part of the submarine task force six decades ago, Kichiji Dewa. The midget sub they'll be looking for was sunk by an American destroyer well before the attack began and could have alerted American forces, but did not. 
So, gentlemen, I'd like to introduce some colleagues here. Good morning, good morning, sir. Will Lehner and Russ Reitz were there when it happened. Glad that we can be friends. Glad that we can be friends. For Ballard, the expedition offers an opportunity to clear up a common misconception. Well, I think most people think that the first shot was fired by the Japanese uh, as they swooped over the Pali and descended on our uh, sleeping fleet that Sunday morning. But in fact, the first shot was fired out here and it was fired by a, a U.S. destroyer. Not only was it the first shots fired by America in the war, it should have alerted us that something was going on. I find it incredibly ironic that the attack and sinking of this Japanese submarine an hour before the planes arrived did not alert us. And I just find that to be amazing. Ballard's tight schedule only allows him two weeks for the mission, sponsored by National Geographic. At, at but the search area isn't too large and he does have the right equipment. Now, all he needs is a little luck. We gotta get it out. November 26th, 1941. The Japanese Armada slipped out of port and headed east through wintry seas. Six carriers were grouped at the center of the formation, surrounded by a protective ring of cruisers, battleships, and destroyers, some 30 ships in all. Because the success of the mission rested on taking the Americans totally by surprise, their route would take them well north of commercial shipping lanes. If another ship spotted them, the mission would be in jeopardy and possibly called off. Strict radio silence was maintained at all times as the attack force moved into position, while far to the south, five Japanese submarines were already closing in on the island of Oahu. Each mother sub, as it was called, carried one midget submarine lashed to its after deck. Together, they made up the most controversial element of the strike force. The Japanese wanted to put everything that they had into this attack, and they had midget submarines. And so let's use them, was Yamamoto's decision. Now there were people in the Japanese high command that objected strongly to that. Don't bring submarines into Pearl Harbor. In the first place, they're not gonna get in. In the second place, they're not gonna do much damage if they do. And in the third place, and by far more important, that's gonna tip off the Americans. Their attack is coming. It's gonna put the Americans up in general quarters all across Pearl Harbor and all across Hawaii. So don't use them. But they did use them. Each midget sub would carry a two-man crew into battle, 10 hand-picked, highly trained young men who were prepared to die for their country. On the night before the attack, they would penetrate Pearl Harbor, wait on the bottom for the planes to strike, then fire their two torpedoes at any large ship in their range. If circumstances permitted, they would try to leave the harbor and rendezvous with the mother subs. But no one really expected the submariners to return. They were young, they were enthusiastic, they were courageous, they were ready to go out and die for the emperor, and it was a suicide mission. Nobody said that quite that way, but that's what it was, a suicide mission. And these guys were eager for it. あの、当時の我々の気持ちとしてはですね、悲壮な感じいうのはありませんね。
There was no sense of impending tragedy. Everyone felt that we were simply carrying out our duty by taking part in military action, though I felt that they might never make it back. Day one of the search, about two miles outside the narrow channel that leads into Pearl Harbor. It was here, somewhere, that a destroyer called the USS Ward was patrolling in the early hours of December 7th. I was, I was thinking, I was thinking we were a little more that way, but Russ says no, we were a little more this way. Yeah. But we were... Well, then you average those two, right? It's the history that tells you what you need to know. And so you have to steep yourself in the history. And you have to read all sorts of sources because a lot of history is conflicting. Uh, one book will say one thing, one book will say another thing. And so you have to find out, well, what do we all agree upon and where is the uncertainty? Uh, here the uncertainty was, uh, where were they exactly when the attack took place? Coming in from another direction. And all of the historical data. Well, you know, after the war, and in fact during the war, this became a dumping site. And our biggest fear is that they dump something right on top of what we're looking for. So basically what you have down here is a museum of World War II. We don't know what the currents are going to be like. We don't know what the visibility is going to be like. We don't know how the ships can perform. So today is a big learning curve. Day one of our expedition. Ballard decides the work will go faster if he adds another machine to the mix, a remotely operated vehicle called Little Herc. Well, it's, it's uh, imaging ROV, it moves very rapidly. We can cover a lot of ground quick and see a lot of targets quick. So it's just a good way to go. Little Herc is tethered behind a bulkier imaging system called Argus and the two vehicles descend to 600 feet. In the control room, the team gets its first glimpse of the sea floor. There's a, what's this coming up, the cylinder? Is that a torpedo? No, he's a pipe. This is really exciting. Every little thing looks like part of it. Well, it looks like a, these are depth charges. There's a whole bunch of them. There's another one. As the first few days of the search come to an end, they've seen a lot of debris and not much else. Saturday night, December 6th, 1941. Sailors on shore leave filled the bars on Hotel Street in Honolulu. The usual Saturday night crowd gathered for dinner and dancing. At Hickam Field, the airplanes were parked wingtip to wingtip. And in the harbor, the warships of the Pacific Fleet prepared for the night. California, Oklahoma, Maryland, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arizona, Nevada. The last day of peace in the United States was coming to an end. December 7th, 1941, a few minutes after midnight. 10 miles away from the mouth of Pearl Harbor, the five mother submarines prepared to launch the midgets. The Japanese crews could see the lights on Waikiki and make out strains of jazz when the wind shifted. Each of the submariners wrote a letter to his parents. Sadamu Kamita was a quiet mountain boy who loved baseball. Forgive this negligent son for not writing these long months. We are soon to be dispatched to regions unknown. Should anything happen to me, do not grieve or mourn. Should I fail to write, do not be alarmed. For it means I am well, 
and discharging my duties faithfully. Goodbye. The night before they left, Commander Yokoyama, his crewman Kamida, and I went to the officers' mess that normally enlisted men couldn't enter. We ate a farewell dinner. Later, there was a small party in the officers' wardroom. Dewa watched his friends enter the midget sub and spoke to Yokoyama one last time over a phone link. I said something like, take care to them. I didn't say anything special, just words of parting said on the phone, very normal. Even though the fact that they wouldn't return was a foregone conclusion, we didn't talk about it. The midget carried by Dewa submarine was the first to leave, released into the water around 1 a.m. By 3 a.m., all the midgets were making their way toward the harbor, except the one skippered by Ensign Sakamaki. He was having trouble with his gyroscope. Without it, he'd have to take his bearings on the surface and risk being spotted by an American ship. You're sneaking into a harbor. You don't want to trip the alarm and uh, let the Americans know that the war has begun. And so you must be extremely nervous. You've got to be just on pins and needles. And then, the first missed opportunity for the Americans. At 3.42 a.m., an officer on board the minesweeper Condor spotted a periscope in the water 50 yards off the port bow. Condor alerted the ward, patrolling the approaches to Pearl Harbor. Remember about 3, 3.30 or so, we, uh, the skipper called general quarters about 3.20, 3.30. I don't remember the exact time, but remember that? that? I remember yeah. that. And uh, we thought, what kind of a skipper is this? He just came aboard, and now we got general quarters, and he's going to start night. He's going to start drilling us. And we thought, remember, just, we thought... It was just a drill. Yeah, that skipper is going to be a tough one to live with. Yes, but he was one of the best he skippers was. we ever had, remember? But the ward's new skipper misunderstood the message and went to look in the wrong place. The one thing Japanese planners feared most had occurred. Four hours before the attack, one of their ships had been spotted, and nothing happened. Sunday, December 7th, around dawn. Aboard the six aircraft carriers, the pilots and planes of the first wave began to assemble. Yamamoto's plan called for two distinct waves of attack the first to reach Honolulu at about 8 a.m., the second to follow within the hour. It meant getting the right aircraft into the air at the right time. Each wave would take about 15 minutes to launch. The first to go were 43 Mitsubishi fighters armed with machine guns and cannon, the dreaded Zeros. Then, 49 Nakajima bombers, Kates, each carrying a single 1,760-pound armor-piercing bomb. 51 Aichi dive bombers were next to leave, the Vals. And finally, another 40 Kates carrying specially modified torpedoes. At about 6.20 a.m., the planes formed up 
and headed south. At almost the same time the first wave turned toward Oahu, the U.S. Navy got its second report of intruders near the harbor. At 6.30 a.m., a lookout on the freighter Antares spotted another submarine periscope, then a conning tower. Once again, the ward raced to investigate, and this time, the destroyer found what she was looking for. The submarine started to surface, and I'm uh, midships right at the rail, and see when I see this thing start to surface, I thought, wow, what's this? Then the skipper took after this submarine. And of course, we didn't know it at the time, but later on he told us that his first thought was ramming it. But he said, this is my first ship and I don't want to ruin it. And then all of a sudden, number one gun fired and they missed because their elevation was great enough and we were that close. And then number three gun fired I saw the splash, the waterline of the conning tower as it, the shell hit the conning tower. It must have rang like a bell. I mean, just must have been an incredible explosion that went off right next to their head. I mean, remember that the skipper is standing in the conning tower and the shell hit the conning tower. You would think he was, must have died instantly, uh, or did he? Because they then began to dive, so clearly they weren't dead. They then began to dive, and no sooner did they dive than the depth charges came. And then they exploded, and I didn't see the submarines that came up, but I'm told that it came up, rolled over, and then went back down again. After the depth charges that we dropped, I can't see any way it could have gotten away from us. At 6.51 a.m., Skipper William Outerbridge of the ward radioed headquarters that he had seen and fired upon an unidentified submarine. He repeated the message two minutes later. At headquarters, the ward's terse report slowly worked its way up the chain of command. For the second time that morning, the Japanese had tripped the alarm. And for the second time that morning, nothing happened. Day 10 of Ballard's search, and still no sign of what they're looking for. And that was we were in here. The, yeah, the submarine, the submarine is coming this way, and we were coming this way. Why was this one on the surface? Maybe he's not sure, but uh, maybe uh, the the passenger in the small submarine, they are looking, and then they make sure the position. So far, Ballard has covered about two square miles of seabed in an area called the Flats where the ward was patrolling. So far, they've seen a lot of debris, but the missing sub has eluded them. Each time they pick up a promising target on sonar, it turns out to be something else. A crumpled seaplane used by the Navy in the late 20s and 30s. A Grumman Hellcat fighter. Then, part of a similar type of midget sub, captured later in the war, and then dumped. And finally, something that seems to have treads. What is that? Tank. You think so? Yeah, it's a tank. The track vehicle. Well, let's work it over. So they don't more than one thing. Yeah, look. Another day search is coming to an end without results. Well, exhausted all our targets. Yep. Nothing left to look at. All right, well, 
Knowing left is the base of the wall and that the sub does, so let's uh, call it a wrap and pull it up, okay? Out of the pool. Yeah. Not out in the flats, so uh, very, very good. the only place left is uh, up against the wall. Yeah. Yep. So tomorrow we'll come out with the two subs and take it right in next to the channel and look at the base of the wall, which we good. couldn't do with these vehicles. Good. Good. They've used up most of their allotted two weeks with nothing to show for it. For Bob Ballard and his team, time is running out. December 7th, 1941, 7 a.m. A mobile radar station on the northwest coast of Oahu picked up the signal of a massive number of aircraft approaching the island from the north. They were less than 140 miles away, moving at 180 miles an hour. A telephone call went immediately to the information center in Honolulu, 40 miles to the southeast. The call was routed to a private named McDonald, who passed it on to a Lieutenant Tyler, who had just been assigned to the job. Tyler told the radar operators not to worry about it. In his mind, it was just a squadron of American B-17s due in from the mainland. For the third time that day, the Japanese had tripped the alarm. And for the third time, no one seemed to notice. It was 7.15 a.m. At 7.40 a.m., the first wave of airplanes reached the coast of Oahu, guided by the signal from a Honolulu radio station. The bombers and torpedo planes were at 9,000 feet. 5,000 feet above them, the Zeros flew cover. The first wave began to break up into their attack formations. One to fly inland toward Wheeler Airfield. The other to move down the western coast to Pearl Harbor. They were the only planes in the sky there was no sign whatsoever that the Americans knew they were about to be attacked. At 7.50 a.m., the first wave reached Pearl Harbor. Among their first targets, Hickam Airfield and the naval air base on Ford Island. Clarence Miner was an airman stationed on Ford Island. After all that noise and the tin roof up there and stuff were popping around, I looked up and I saw this airplane come diving down and that big meatball and I said, oh shit. And then all, all hell all over the place was breaking loose. Bombs dropping, machine gun fire. And like I said, the thing was so darn low you could throw rocks at them. Ralph Lindenmeyer was also on Fort Island. 7.55 in the morning, an explosion woke us up. I looked up at the clock when I first heard the explosion and felt it, and I said, the Japs are here. And when I looked out the window, the plane came over, and it, it I saw the meatball on the fuselage and the wings, and I could look into the pilot's face, and I could almost see him grinning. Anchored on Pier 1010 was the utility vessel Argon, where 19-year-old Charles Christensen worked in the machine shop. 
And I thought, oh, that was a bad explosion. I wonder what happened. And I opened the porthole up, and I stuck my head right on out there, you know, and oh, boy, was there ever a fire on Ford Island. I thought, oh, my goodness, something is really bad blowing up over there. It took a while for sailors and the ships at anchor to comprehend what was happening. Bert Davis, a machinist mate on the USS Selfridge, thought it was some kind of readiness drill. That's where I was standing when the planes came in. I was standing there shining my shoes. And uh, I saw these planes coming in. Came in, and came right straight across where the Raleigh was. And I thought to myself, what in the hell is the Army doing holding maneuvers on a day like this? While the dive bombers hammered the airfields, the torpedo planes descended to an altitude of a few dozen feet and took dead aim at Battleship Row. Aboard the Argonne, Charles Christensen had a perfect view of the first torpedo runs. He's coming in almost straight across me at a slight angle across, and he's low enough that he's maybe 30 feet off of the water, which puts him maybe eye level or a little more from me. And I can see the man's face. He's got his helmet on, he's got his goggles on, and he's looking over the side. And when he straightened that plane out, leveled it out, he dropped that torpedo. And I thought, oh my God, look at that. And that torpedo just went as straight for the Oklahoma as it could go. This photo, taken from a Japanese plane, shows Battleship Row just after the attack began. The ripples emanating outward are the result of multiple torpedo strikes. George Smith was below deck on the battleship Oklahoma when General Quarter sounded. Then all of a sudden, the guy came over to the loudspeaker, this is no shit, move it. And then we got a torpedo. I was really so scared, I didn't know what the hell was going on. The Oklahoma started to capsize almost immediately. When they said abandoned ship, the only way we could get out was through the Kingsman window. We went out there, and the ship was rolling on top of us. Maybe we jumped about five feet into the water, which wasn't far. But when you turn around and see this thing coming on top of you, you swim for all you can swim and as fast as you can swim. Because we know we had to get around the big gun turrets. They were coming over next on us. It went over so fast, I, I just was sure I didn't know, but I was sure they were trapped inside of that because it, it just rolled right on over, and there it was, keel up. George Smith had just been released from the Oklahoma's brig for going ashore without leave and it saved his life. And when the ship got the torpedo, the brig was in the carpenter shop on board ship. And when the torpedo hit, it broke the carpenter's workbench loose, pinned the guard against the wall, the bulkhead, and he couldn't release the other men that were in the brig and they all drowned. On the far side of Fort Island, the old battleship Utah also got hit a few minutes before eight. Clark Simmons worked on the Utah as a mess attendant. And as I looked out the port, I saw a plane making a run on the Utah. And as she dropped her the torpedo, the wing dipped, and then he straightened up, and the torpedo hit it, and another one right behind it did the same thing. And we knew that it was just a matter of time before the ship was going to sink. And actually, it took eight minutes. In eight minutes, the ship was, was history. She, she had turned turtle in eight minutes. As the lines would begin to part, came over the side and began to swim toward Fort Island. And as we were swimming, they were machine gunning us from both, from both directions, from this direction. And when they came from Pearl City over here, from that direction. So. 
I saw fellas yelling and screaming. Some of the fellas in the water I was asking for help. It was just, it was so chaotic. I really didn't know what was going on. But the biggest blow was yet to come. Lying inboard of the repair ship Vestal was the battleship Arizona. High overhead, a cake released an armor-piercing bomb that drifted down toward the Arizona's number two gun turret. It was about 10 minutes after eight. A motion picture camera captured the moment of impact. In that instant, more than a thousand crewmen died. Stu Headley was on the West Virginia, a few hundred feet away. One gigantic explosion. Now, when we fired the 16-inch, uh, you're inside. It sounds like thunder up in the distance. But this didn't sound like no thunder. This was one gigantic explosion. The stern of our ship lifted out of the water. But at the same time, we were getting with, hit with torpedoes. We were starting to list. But we saw about 32 men flying through the air from the Arizona. Oil from the fully fueled Arizona began to spread and catch fire. The heat was so intense, even sailors on nearby ships were threatened. So Crosland and I stripped right down to our undershorts and jumped in and swam underwater. Now, we're not underwater swimmers, but we swam underwater that day because that was the hottest breath of air we ever breathed, because that was the oil from the Arizona that was ablaze. The bomb had penetrated Arizona's forward magazine and ignited more than a million pounds of gunpowder. Those who were still alive found themselves in an inferno. They were in this oil that was on fire. They were trying to swim out of it. They'd come up and trying to get their breath. Their eyes, the white of their eyes was just as red as they can be. I, I, I can just see it today. The skin on their face was just falling off. And on top of that, all of this oil, and they were just drenched in oil. Bert Davis went out in a whaleboat to pick up survivors. Oh, God, it was horrible. Then. This one fella started to reach up to try to get a hold of the gunnel on the boat from the outside, and I reached down to try to help him. And I took him by the arm, and as I tried to lift like that, it scared me. <laughs> it all came off. <laughs> he was dead by the time we got him in. Thirty-five minutes after the attack began, the first wave flew away, leaving behind more than a thousand dead American sailors, many of them teenagers, caught below deck when Arizona exploded and sank. Six decades after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Arizona still lies where she sank with her cargo of sailors. Most of their bodies have never been recovered. Her superstructure was removed during the war. Only the mount of her number three turret remains above water. The Arizona was built nearly a century ago 
and she spent more than half that time underwater. The National Park Service, which is responsible for maintaining the memorial, periodically checks on her condition. Her passageways and hatches. Her 14-inch guns. The interior of the ship is too dangerous for divers, so it's never been investigated by the Park Service. Until now. With the help of a tiny ROV made available by National Geographic, workers will get their first glimpse of Arizona's condition deep inside the ship since about the time she went down. The initial survey reveals that the corrosion is worse than expected. And that may portend an ecological disaster because of something happening deep within the ship. The Arizona has been leaking an estimated quart of oil a day ever since she sank. But the Park Service is worried that the remaining bunkers could give way. Current estimates are that there's approximately half a million gallons, possibly in the bunkers on the aft section of the ship. And so with current technology, can we get to those bunkers? And what's happening with the metal on the hull and the internal portions of the ship? And so that's what we're trying to do is find out, is there a way that we can contain that oil? The problem is complicated by the ship's designation as a grave site and by the oil's symbolic meaning. Many visitors and survivors consider the oil to either be the tears of the ship or the, the ship is bleeding. We'll also be dealing with that emotional feelings that people have about the oil and, and the significance. It'll be a balance between what protecting the ecosystem is all about and protecting this, the tomb, the shrine that this place symbolizes. Inside the memorial, a wall lists the 1177 servicemen who died on the battleship. Every returning survivor knew someone who died on December 7th. Oh, sweet, uh, Smith, uh, uh, Randolph Smith, he got machine gun. They never had a chance. They didn't know what was coming. Nobody knew about it. They never woke up. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, I was going to ask you for a big hug. I'm going to put a big yeah. one in there. Big, big hug. I thought maybe... Big, yeah. big hug. Let me give this lady a hug. I thought maybe that uh, you wouldn't want to hug an ugly old man. Oh, I, I do. I do want to. <laughs> Carl Carson was a 20-year-old sailor on the Arizona the day she went down. He decided to come back to Pearl Harbor when doctors told him he didn't have much longer to live. Well, I lost a lot of good, dear friends over there. Just, it's just awful hard to even think about it. I almost lost my own life. There. I hope, I hope I can make it over there all right. Get the, okay. I need a little support. Carl has never talked very much about what happened to him that day. Now, at last, it's time. This, this is where I came out of, turret three. Right. Came back on, on this, there used to be ladders up and down the thing, and I came out the, the turret and went down. Well, I was out on deck doing the morning chores. All of a sudden, there's plane come along, and didn't pay much attention to it because planes were landing at Ford Island all the time. And all of a sudden, the chips started flying all around me, and there was a plane that was strafing me. 
and uh, somebody hollered, it's the damn Japs, get undercover. Bomb went off. I learned later it was back by turret number four, about where I'd been working about 10, 15 minutes before. And evidently it knocked me out, ruptured both my lungs, and I got smoke inhalation, and all the lights went out. I don't know how long I laid there, but when I woke up, there was no panic down there or anything, but there was smoke and water knee deep. I run into a friend of mine that he was crying and, and asking me for help, and I looked at him in horror. And the skin on his face and his arms and everything was just hanging off like, like a mask or something. And I took hold of his arm. Skin, skin all came off in my hand. And there was nothing in this world I could do for that boy. And that had bothered me all of my life. Well, they gave the word to abandon ship. And we just practically stepped off of the quarter deck into the water. And I guess I must have passed out. And went down in the water and everything was just as peaceful and nice. And I, it had been so easy to just let go. And I saw this bright light and something made me come to. And so I got back up the surface of the water and, and oil all around, I had water in my oil in my teeth and, and down my throat and everything. And it tasted horrible. I still taste it today. The oil was a fire all around. The man saw me down there and the fire was approaching me. It wasn't about two feet from me. And he reached down and pulled me up out of the water and that man saved my life. Bob Ballard has spent the entire mission searching the flats outside the harbor without finding any sign of the lost midget sub. This is a mile. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop you down here at the, uh, base. At, at the base. Now he's turning his attention to the steep coral escarpment running roughly parallel to the shore, an area he calls the wall. In an expedition like this, uh, you have to put your mind in the mind of the commander of the submarine because his actions are going to define the size of the search area. What he does at that moment is going to uh, tell you how big a search area you have to have. Uh, clearly, if he was killed outright, then you didn't have to put yourself in his mind at all because he's dead and he's going to be right where they say he sank. But if he's still alive, he's going to then take certain evasive actions. And you have to then say, well, if I were that person, what would I do? And there were two options he had. One was to continue forward into Pearl Harbor, or the other was to turn and run for the high seas. If the midget made a run for the high seas and sank farther out, there's no hope of finding it in the remaining time. But if it had continued toward the harbor, Ballard's team might stand a chance with the help of their own miniature submersible. The one disadvantage of using a submersible is that Ballard's team won't be able to see what the subpilot is seeing during the dive. They'll have to rely on his descriptions over the radio and look at a videotape later. We've uh, landed the sub. It's going to land about uh, 200 meters of water, head due north. As you can see, the airport's right there, so it's going to run into something and it's going to run into a wall and then it's going to head west along that wall uh, because if the submarine hit against that wall, it's going to fall down to the base. So we're going to spend the day exploring the base of the steep scarp that leads right up the channel into Pearl Harbor. It's 
To me, uh, deep workers look like sort of manned robots. They've got a human inside of them, but they have this big, you know, this exoskeleton. Uh, but what they do is they, they permit a person to be highly maneuverable. They can spin on their axis uh, and they can go into very dangerous places because they're so small. In the control room, all anyone can do is listen to the squawk box. Yeah, Mark, give us uh, maybe like 15. I want to try to uh, really nail this guy. It's pretty incredible. They just reported finding a pile of batteries. And this submarine was a lot of batteries. So, starting to look like, smell like, and, but we're not sure. Then, the sub-pilot spots a torpedo. 80, did he say? Right, where it should get interesting, and it is getting interesting. Uh, he's picked up a torpedo and debris right in the area where we'd expect the uh, submarine to uh, impact it with the wall. Ballard feels they are getting close, but they can't be sure of anything until they retrieve deep worker and take a look at the videotape. December 7th, 8.35 a.m., and the beginning of a brief 20-minute lull in the action. At airfields all over the island, crews scrambled to clear the runway so American planes could get in the air. Anti-aircraft guns were made ready. Field hospitals were set up to take care of the wounded, many of them burn victims. The first stories of individual acts of heroism began to make the rounds. One of them was about a mess attendant on the West Virginia named Dory Miller. Miller had carried the wounded captain of his ship to safety, then taken up a machine gun and shot down at least two Japanese planes. What made this story remarkable is that Dory Miller had never handled a machine gun, much less trained on one, because he was black. And like all African Americans in the 1941 Navy, restricted to the lowest ranking jobs. Fourteen men received America's highest military award, the Medal of Honor, for their heroism on that day. But Dory Miller wasn't one of them. He got the Navy Cross instead. And the only reason why he didn't get the congressional vote, because he was black, you know, and the, the Navy being what it was at that time, he only could be a servant to the officers. He never gave any thought for his life or anything. He grabbed a machine gun and he just started blasting away over the side of the ship. What he did was courageous, and many of us thought that man should have been given the Congressional Medal of Honor. Two years after Pearl Harbor, Dory Miller died when his ship went down, torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. Pearl Harbor, 8.55 a.m. The seas were still boiling with smoke and flame when the second wave of the Japanese attack struck the island. This time, 167 aircraft split into two main groups. One headed inland, the other hugged the eastern coast and continued south to Pearl Harbor.
But this time, the Americans fought back. in the harbor was now so thick the Japanese pilots had trouble seeing their targets. One of the targets was the battleship Nevada with a hole in her side steaming toward the channel. Dive bombers honed in on the crippled giant. If they could sink the battleship now it might block the channel and trap the fleet in the harbor. With all of these planes coming in, when the Nevada got underway, the planes come in, dive bombing that. It looked like bees coming back to the hive. There were so many of them in there at one time that uh, it was amazing that they didn't collide. With bombs falling all around, Nevada's commander was able to run his ship aground on Hospital Point, which kept her from sinking and left the channel clear. By 10 o'clock, it was over. The second wave of attackers headed back to their carriers, leaving behind a shattered American Pacific fleet. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation. On the mainland, Americans were stunned by the news they were hearing from Pearl Harbor. Every American alive over 65 years of age can remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they got the news. It was a unifying event. It brought us together. Nothing else could have done it in that way. And dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December... President Roosevelt addressed the Congress the following day. A state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. By December 11th, the United States was at war with Germany and Japan, plunging it into a conflict that would forever change its place in the world. Back in Pearl Harbor, one problem survivors faced was notifying people back home that they were okay. The Navy told us that everybody send a postcard home to your parents, let them know everything's all right. But I got one of the last postcards out of there and I sent it home on December the 9th, exactly when I sent it home. And uh, my mother didn't get that postcard until February, the first week of February sometime. I don't know why it took so long, but that's what it did. She didn't know if I was alive or dead. When the mailman got the card at the post office, he closed down the office and ran all the way to my house. He woke my mother and stepfather up at 6 o'clock in the morning and told them, your son's OK, here's a card. Ha, huh. I still have that card. My mom, she couldn't believe it. Believe it. Uh, I get emotional when I think about it, how she says she, she felt. Uh, I just don't know. It just turns me on. Jack McCarran had been married to his high school sweetheart, Roberta, for seven weeks when the attack came. It wasn't until Christmas Day that she found out what had happened to her husband, who was stationed on the Arizona. The Navy Department deeply regrets to inform you 
that your husband, John Harry McCarran, gunner's mate, second, U.S. Navy, has been reported wounded in action in the performance of his duty and in the service of his country. This was received by me Christmas morning, 7 a.m., December 25th, 1941. Yuck. <laughs> yep, I hate to say this, but in my entire 81 years of living, that was the worst time in my entire life was to have received this telegram because I had no idea whether or not my husband of 49 days <laughs> was alive or dead. Lying in a hospital on Oahu, badly burned, Jack decided to spare his new wife the horror of seeing him again. I said, tell Robert, tell Robert to forget about me and go back to Saugus. So, um, you know, I've been burned and I, I had um, my, I didn't look like me. I guess my face and my hair was only like a, you know, shot on top of which it being Christmas. I was 3,000 miles away from my home, 3,000 miles away from my husband. I didn't know anybody. I guess I never did write to you for a oh, No. I didn't write to her for a long time. <laughs> the state of shock I was in was almost as bad as his. But some time passed before I, I probably started coming out of it and I was aboard ship and you know I love this girl and now uh, I realized that if I was going to survive it would be with her my friends and shipmates took me over to uh, the sick bay at four dollar and they laid me alongside the bulkhead over there and and I looked over another shipmate laying across from in against the bulkhead, and he was holding his intestines in with his hand. And he looked up at me, and he said, it, it sure war sure is hell, isn't it, shipmate? And I said, yeah, it is. Well, lately I was diagnosed with stomach cancer, and I don't figure I have too many more years to live. And I thought that perhaps I might be a poor spokesman, so to speak, for my shipmates in telling my story so that they wouldn't be forgotten. And that's one and only reason that I came back. And I'm a kind of a private person. It's been hard to do, but I think it was time that it needed to be told. And. Uh, I think it has been well worth it. I, I feel a lot better now. It's the final day of the search, and Ballard has had his machines in the water for hours. But he's not hopeful about the outcome. We're uh, in the final throes of this expedition. I mean, today is the last day we have uh, two subs going in the water right now, but we're, you know, it doesn't look good because we've looked at all the high priority sites and we haven't found the midget submarine. We're now out in the very low priority areas and that can go on forever because it's a big ocean. So uh, I'd be very surprised if we uh, succeeded today. Deep Worker returns from its pass at the wall and is hoisted out of the water for the final time. With it is a videotape of the debris it encountered. The news isn't encouraging. Uh, we have a possibility, but I'm, I'm personally uh, not overly optimistic. 
A quick review of the videotape confirms Ballard's fears. On closer examination, what had looked to the sub-pilot like a pile of batteries turns out to be something else. Looks like an aircraft gun clips. Or hack hack or... Yeah. Know what it looks like to you? And the torpedo the pilot spotted has had its warhead removed. So it can't be from the lost midget sub. You reach a moment when you know you're not going to succeed. Because you've you've given it the best shot, they're, they're, you're you're going back over the same territory, seeing the same targets a second or third time. Well, we found a bunch of junk. We don't really have a, a definitive set of objects that says that the submarine broke up, but it could have. So. Clearly, the sub did not survive. And did the ward play a role in its demise? And certainly it did. Uh, but how did it finally meet its end? Gloriously in battle in Pearl Harbor? Was it sunk by someone else later on? What was its final moments? And for now, we don't know what they were. The mystery of what happened to the midget subs would have been even deeper had it not been for our surprise development on the morning of December 8th, 1941. In the early morning hours, a small submarine washed ashore on Oahu's east coast. It was the one piloted by Ensign Kazuo Sakamaki, the sub with the gyroscope problems. Sakamaki also washed ashore, exhausted and delirious. He was captured before he could kill himself and thus became America's first prisoner of war. Of the 10 submariners who set out before dawn on the 7th, Sakamaki was the only one who survived. Historians have generally labeled the submarine mission a failure, since only one midget that we know of entered the harbor and was sunk during the attack after firing two harmless torpedoes. But analysis of a photo taken from a Japanese airplane just as the battle began suggests something else. It shows Battleship Row already under attack a few minutes after eight, and in the water just beyond, a shadowy shape that appears to be a small submarine, and the wake of a torpedo aimed directly at the West Virginia. While some historians remain skeptical, that analysis could explain a message Dewa received on the night of the 7th, more than 12 hours after the attack. It came from his friend, Ensign Yokoyama. Successful surprise attack, then silence. Yokoyama sub never made the rendezvous and neither did any of the others. For years, Dewa has wondered what happened to Yokoyama and all the others who didn't come back. All he knows is that somewhere in these waters, they die as they expected they would. <laughs> Of course, I hoped they would return, but the commander told me, if I come back, I'll come back with a wolf, as we say in Japan, and put the mother sub in danger. So I don't think they plan to return, even if they had succeeded. 
Before he set out on his mission, one of the Submariners left behind a poem he'd written earlier that day. As the cherry blossoms fall at the height of their glory, so too must I fall, that men may call me a flower of Yamato, though my bones lie scattered in the bleak wilderness of strange and distant lands. On the last day of his visit, Dewa asked to see the Arizona Memorial to pay his respects to the Americans who died on December 7th. American Japan must have had their reasons for starting a war, but after coming here and seeing the waves of the Pacific, I question why we had to go to war. Japan and the United States are brothers. Pacific peace is world peace. This trip has made me feel that together we must protect it. Jack McCarran and Carl Carson are also there to remember their ship and their shipmates. Underwater, the National Geographic camera prowls through the empty ship. These are the first images of the officers' quarters, images from another era, frozen in time. A bathroom with its regulation soap dish. An officer's desk, its papers still arranged in their pigeonholes. A wash basin, now filled with sand beneath a shaving mirror. For Jack McCarran, the pictures of his old ship are almost too painful to bear. Over 40 years, over 40 years, I couldn't, if I was asked, I couldn't talk. I didn't talk about it, I didn't think about it. I had erased it from my mind. I didn't have any memories. I really didn't. I saw that barnacles on that doorknob and the, the light in the overhead, and the thoughts were, who was that officer down in there? Did he survive? At one time, he, that knob was real nice and shiny, and he turned on that light to read. I don't remember the ship as that. Three days after the attack, the Arizona continued to burn. The final totals from the surprise assault were staggering. More than 2,400 deaths and almost 1,200 wounded. 21 ships of the U.S. Pacific Fleet had been sunk or damaged, including all eight battleships. Over 300 airplanes had been put out of commission. Admiral Yamamoto had accomplished everything he set out to do except destroy the American aircraft carriers. And in the fighting to come, that would prove to be a critical failure. One of the best things that ever happened in the United States was our carriers were not involved in the attack. Yamamoto sank battleships. 
But the battleship was not the queen of the seas any longer. After that day, from now on, it's the aircraft carrier. And the attack on Pearl Harbor, for all of the losses of lives, which comes first, of course, and the losses of ships, they didn't sink any aircraft carriers. And that made what was already a very bad mistake on Japan's part even worse. But perhaps the greatest miscalculation was how the defeat would affect the American fighting spirit. Instead of being a crippling blow, it became a rallying cry. The next morning, the fire was still burning, and there was a ship, some of them, and I'm not for sure that some of them that still had the flag flying from yesterday. And at 8 o'clock, guess what? These ships are sitting there in the mud. It's time to raise the flag, and there's the American flag flying. Everything is fine. And then the Americans went to work. Every ship that had been hit, except the Arizona, Utah, and Oklahoma, was refloated, repaired, and put back into service. Many would take part in the battles yet to come. Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and so would the men who survived that day. I grew up in the Navy. I learned a lot. When I came out of the Navy, I was six foot even, weighed 200 pounds. I actually grew up. I learned to be, a, we say, a man. When I walk as a Pearl Harbor survivor, especially when I have my uniform on, I walk very proud. I represent the country, and I will represent it to the day I die. And I will always be proud to be part of it. Well, Pearl Harbor to me is like beginning a new life. I may be a certain age, but it seemed that I was reborn that day. Pearl Harbor survivors are special. They have a feeling for each other and for their country. They have a comradeship that is not matched anywhere in the civilian world. The only people that I've ever met who have that kind of comradeship are foxhole buddies. These guys were in a foxholes together. It's not a feeling of we showed them. It's not a feeling of triumph. It's a feeling of we did it together. We were there. And that's what matters. It's kind of a hallowed place, and it's, uh, it's very beautiful. And I'm, I'm amazed that it's, it's just beautiful. Now I understand that there's millions of visitors every year that come by and pay their respect to my shipmates. To lots of them, I know a lot of them, they were just names. But to me, they'll always be my shipmates. I don't think we'll ever be done with Pearl Harbor. I think Pearl Harbor is like Gettysburg. It's like Appomattox. It's like Lincoln's assassination. It's like Yorktown and the surrender to General Washington. God help our country if it's ever forgotten. Four years after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese surrender was signed here on the USS Missouri. America was victorious in a war that began with a stunning military defeat. But in many ways, it was a defeat that strengthened us. Pearl Harbor holds a special place in our collective memory because it redefined the role of America in the world. It brought us together, 
and set the United States on a course that would make it a superpower. It redefined the American spirit for the modern age. Like the Pearl Harbor survivors, a million Americans make a special pilgrimage to this place every year. 60 years after the battle, they come to honor the dead, but also to reflect on how that singular Sunday changed us as a nation. I'm Tom Brokaw. Thank you for joining us. And now, National Geographic presents U-Boats, Terror on Our Shores. Nineteen forty-one. The Atlantic seaboard of the United States. To Americans, the war in Europe is a distant menace, too far away to touch their shores. Or so they think. The arm of war is about to extend its reach. From below these waters, an army is coming. Soon the United States will suffer its worst defeat at sea. And most Americans will never know about it. December, 1941. Five German U-boats set out on a secret mission, codenamed Operation Drumbeat. The boats depart from German-occupied France, heading across the Atlantic to take up positions along the North American coast. Once in place, they will attack merchant shipping, carrying cargo vital to the Allied war effort. Leading the assault will be U-boat 123. Its destination, New York Harbor. Commanding the boat is 28-year-old Reinhard Hartigan. The lieutenant commander's audacity is already legendary among the U-boat fleet. I was very proud to go to New York to be one of the first submarines. Uh, it was war and I was a soldier of the German Navy and so uh, it was a very uh, big thing for me. You see. But first, they must cross 3,000 miles of bitter seas. U-boats were designed for destruction, not comfort. Loaded with 15 torpedoes and 180 rounds of heavy artillery, the boats leave little room for their crews. Food is squeezed into every available space. But soon the fresh bread and meat will begin to rot. With no heaters, the boat's inside temperature matches that of the cold Atlantic, and a continual moist fog permeates every compartment. The bunks, each assigned one set of sheets for the entire trip, sleep several men in rotating shifts. But the hardship is overshadowed by the constant danger of detection. 
Watchmen above keep an eye on the horizon. Radio messages are encrypted in one of the most complex codes ever devised, one the Germans are confident the enemy will never decipher. But they are wrong. British intelligence has broken the code and is tracking Operation Drumbeat westward. They pass on the information to Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Navy, Admiral Ernest J. King. But King fails to respond. Admiral King was an Anglophobe, did not like the British, detested the Royal Navy, and would not heed the intelligence that that Navy sent him. This is one of the most remarkable things about Drumbeat in that the entire operation was known to the Americans. The almost exact courses and positions of the U-boats were transmitted by London to Washington day by day, and yet Admiral King and his subordinate commanders did nothing about it. Admiral King underestimated the U-boat. He thought of it still as a ship that was ancillary to the fleet, instead of being, as the Germans used it, an independently operating weapons platform with immense destructive power. Drumbeat is supposed to begin on January 13th, with simultaneous attacks by all five U-boats. But one day ahead of schedule, just east of Cape Cod, Hardigan sights an opportunity too good to pass up. Operation Drumbeat begins early. A British steamer is 123's first victim. 100 men perish. January 14th, off Long Island, New York. 123 torpedoes its second ship. The Norwegian tanker sends out an SOS. But only 123 hears it. Hardigan moves boldly closer to the shore. Traveling on the surface, he follows the lights of Long Island. Unlike Europe, the U.S. has yet to practice blackout procedures, allowing Hardigan to search for targets against a well-lit shoreline. Hardigan creeps toward New York Harbor. His mission has been devised in such haste that he lacks adequate charts and must rely on tourist maps. Near midnight, Hardigan brings 123 to a stop and calls his men to the bridge to behold the very symbol of American confidence and might, New York City. It was fascinating. We had never dreamed of seeing New York. The whole atmosphere, the lights, the size. We had been at sea for such a long time and only seen water. To suddenly see this splendor, it was fascinating. With a Navy nowhere in sight, U-123 travels south on the surface in broad daylight. Off the coast of North Carolina, snapshots record what begins to resemble a turkey shoot. I remember one night when we sank two tankers within a very short time. I think it was around about one hour only. When I uh, saw a lot of ships, I looked for the biggest one, the shore. And when I saw a, a small uh, uh, three or four thousand tons, and I saw some lights and I uh, let them go, maybe that it's a bigger one. And this was no special danger, for no special risk. We had no uh, anti-air, anti-submarine uh, against us. So it was no, no special events for us to sink these ships, these poor ships, they ran into our torpedoes. 
January 19th, U-123's bloodiest night. The waters off of Cape Hatteras fill with bodies and wrecked hulls. America grows alarmed at the testimony of survivors. Survivors. 42 seamen, the entire crew of the Norwegian tanker Varanga, are safe in a New Jersey port. Hitler's U-boats strike desperately, sinking six ships in one week. Hardest hit was the steamship city of Atlanta. These two seamen were wounded. 46 shipmates lost their lives. The United States Navy announces that some U-boats were sunk and emphasizes the importance of secrecy about counterblows. When we were struck with the torpedo, we were going south. When uh, I was suddenly awakened, it sounded like somebody had uh, fired a pistol off close to my ear. And I looked out uh, toward the water. The side of the ship that we were on was leaning from starboard to port. And when I stepped off the boat deck, I stepped right into the water. The ship had heeled over that far. Then we started uh, gathering around a skylight that was blown off the engine room. There was a uh, coal passer. He was a black man, old. He was in his, probably in his uh, early 60s. And he was uh, on this, uh, this skylight. And he was kneeling down and, and he was praying. He didn't have a stitch of clothes on at all, and it was cold out there. Kneeling down and praying. And I watched him, and he finished his prayer and rolled over into the water. I never did see him again. Of the 44 men who get off the ship alive, 41 die in the frigid waters. But I never went back to sea after that. I never had any desire to go back after that. Da hat man noch nichts dabei gedacht. We didn't think about it. We were young, 18 years old, and didn't understand the seriousness of it. Noch gar nicht abwärst. Es war etwas wie Freude. There was even a little joy each time we sank another ship. At that age, we didn't reflect on the consequences for the crew and their families. I think for a man going at sea, it's always terrible to see a ship sinking. Never mind if it is uh, by intention to sink the ship or it's, it's by accident or so. Um, but on the other hand, it was our job, to, it was our duty to sink ships. Hartigan has used all his torpedoes. Undeterred, he resorts to a daring maneuver to sink yet another freighter. Surfacing only 200 yards from his target, Hartigan orders his men to the deck gun. Sinking ships with artillery alone becomes a Hartigan trademark. And still the Navy fails to launch a counterattack. It continues to concentrate resources on guarding transatlantic convoys, leaving freighters and tankers plying the American coast unprotected. Calls to change policy failed to persuade Admiral King. Ernest G. King, maybe he was a friend of mine, I don't know, because he did nothing. He had 25 destroyers in the harbor and they let him in the harbor. He made no blackout, n neither at dimming. And so all the 
the whole coast was full of lights, the hotels and the motor cars, and I can, could see the, the ships silhouetted against the uh, uh, lightened coast, and all the ships were with full lights, and all the lighthouses and light ships had full light. And so it was uh, very easy for me, and I don't know till yet why Admiral Ernest Jekin did nothing. That was astonishing for me. Kapitän Leutnant Harding, dessen Boot unmittelbar vor den Toren New Yorks operierte. On February 9th, 1942, the crew of U-123 returns to a hero's welcome at Lorient, France. Flags marking their nine kills string the periscope tower. For his work, Hardigan receives the Knight's Cross. The German High Command, emboldened by stories of unprotected ships, dispatches more U-boats to American waters. Within weeks, Hardigan will join them. But this time, things will be different. 1942. 123 is back in American waters. Six more ships go down. The Navy organizes a campaign of confident reassurance. The United States Navy, the floating ports of America's first line of defense. From Nome to Norfolk, from Guam to Guantanamo, wherever our flag waves over water, there our fighting fleet is prepared to go. Interestingly, the Navy confused and obfuscated and even lied to the American people about this carnage. On April 1, fittingly April Fool's Day, 1942, the U.S. Navy announced that 28 U-boats had been sunk or presumably sunk. But as of that date, not a single U-boat had been sunk in the Atlantic from Maine to Florida. April 10th, believing coastal waters to be safe, thousands of Americans crowd the beaches. But tonight, in Jacksonville, Florida, they will become witnesses to war. Well, I was 14 years old, and I lived at Ponte Vedra Beach. And it was around 9 o'clock, between 9 and 10. And I heard an explosion. We were just on the boardwalk doing things. We got on the merry-go-round. And as I was circling around, coming back so that I was facing the ocean on one of the turns, I saw this enormous orange flame out on the ocean. I thought, well, there's been some sort of accident or something. The, the war never entered my mind. Laden with fuel oil, the tanker Gulf America ignites the sky. I uh, torpedoed the Gulf America off the shore of Jacksonville Beach. She was burning, but uh, was not uh, uh, sunk, and so I uh, want to shell her. But uh, I, I was, uh, the Gulf of America was between my boat and the coast, and so I didn't want to shell her in this way, because if I missed the ship, maybe uh, one shell would hit innocent people uh, ashore. Hardigan swings 123 between the shore and the ship to finish her off with artillery. As we watched, the submarine was between the tanker and the beach so that we could see an outline of the bow of the sub and where the gun was when it fired particularly. So it was a very dramatic thing. The war was so far away. It wasn't as if we were even involved in it until that happened and you actually saw that submarine. And it was so close. It was, it, you, you, it was just unbelievable to think that someone had that much, I mean, that they had that much nerve to come so close to us. In the early morning, 123 moves off, cruising confidently on the surface. 
but the Navy stirs. Spotter planes search the area. This time, Hardigan's fortunes change. The USS Dahlgren, on routine patrol, stumbles across his path. We saw a destroyer, and we tried to get off to deeper water where we could better dive. But the destroyer followed us, and we must dive on a very uh, shallow water. I think it was about 25 meters. As soon as the alert was given, everyone went into action. We each had a job to do. We didn't really understand the danger we faced because we were too busy getting the sub underwater. Then, finally, we heard the screws of the destroyer. Depth charge blast crippled the ship. The engines were out. We couldn't move. We were on the ground. Water had come into the boat. It is a strange feeling. Fixed on a point and knowing the enemy is over you and had the possibility to kill you, and you cannot do anything but wait. Hardigan believes the U boat is beyond repair, that the crew's only option is to flood the ship and swim 70 feet to the surface. As commander, he must open the hatch and be the first to exit. I opened the hatch cover, then at first uh, water came in my neck, and then I heard the destroyer came and I said, oh, let me wait uh, a moment, uh, because if I would come out and he would uh, bomb me with depth charges, I would be dead at once. Inexplicably, the destroyer moves off. The reprieve allows the crew to make repairs, and 123 limps to deeper water. I was lucky. You, you need luck. You must have a good boat and a good crew. If one man was only about uh, 10 seconds uh, late with uh, what he had to do, maybe the whole boat will be lost. And so they all knew what they had to do, and they had to do it in the same moment at once. Though badly damaged and running on only one engine, U-123 isn't through yet. Hardigan has one torpedo left. His target, the SS Leslie, on its way from Cuba to New York with 3,300 tons of sugar. I heard this loud explosion. I thought that it was the... Uh... The firemen had let the water levels go too low in the boilers and he'd blown the gauge glasses, which go off with one hell of a bang, I tell you. And uh, when I saw the sugar and the uh, water start to blow out the shaft alley door, I figured it wasn't the gauge glasses. I knew we'd been hit. Hardigan sinks the Leslie with the last torpedo of his career. Before changing course for France, he once more turns to his deck gun, sending two more ships under. His total of 19 kills adds to the devastation being wrought by many other U-boats, now prowling the North American coast. In all, German U-boats operating from Canada to Panama sink nearly 400 ships in the first six months of 1942. It was the greatest maritime massacre in modern history. It was the greatest defeat at sea ever suffered by the American nation. And it was a far greater disaster than was Pearl Harbor, both in terms of ships sunk and lives lost. Thousands are dying. 
oil and other cargo desperately needed by the Allied forces are being lost to the sea. When the sinkings reach one a day, the Navy is finally forced to act. It adopts proven anti-sub methods, mandating convoys along the coast. The Navy also intensifies ship and air patrols from Maine to Florida. With advancements in anti-submarine weaponry, the tables turn violently. Once been the most dangerous waters in the world for merchant shipping, become perilous for U-boats. Soon no U-boat moves unopposed. Few survive. By the end of World War II, 754 U-boats have been lost worldwide. Of the nearly 40,000 men who served on U-boats, 28,000 never returned from the sea. The highest casualty rate suffered by any branch of the German military. Today, their makeshift coffins litter the ocean floor. There they rest alongside the hulks of the thousands of ships they once so freely stalked. Thank mm -hmm. you.